Hello and welcome. My name is Mulham and I'm the Communication Officer with the Global Protection Cluster. Today's webcast, we're going to be talking about localization. And I have here with me uh, Marie-Emilie. She is the Protection Coordinator with IRC. Hello, Marie, and thank you for being with us today. Hi, Mulham. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to start right away and ask you very basic questions uh, about localization. I want to ask you, what is localization? And what does localization mean for, for coordination? Um, well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, for the question. I think, um, as you know, in, in 2016, the, the World Humanitarian Summit looked at, um, at the challenges that the humanitarian system was facing in, uh, in meeting very unprecedented and growing humanitarian needs. And um, donor aid, aid agencies, NGOs have signed up to the, um, what was called the Grand Bargain, which looked at not only addressing the, the question of, um, of funding, but uh, more generally looking at um, how the international humanitarian system is working and how to make this system more, more efficient, more effective, uh, more fit for purpose. And, um, and given the, the increasing uh, frequency and the intensi and intensity of, of natural disaster and, uh, and the complexity of conflicts, localization really became uh, a priority issue. Um, and it was seen, I think, both as, um, as a major challenge, but also as an opportunity for all of us to, um, to take stock and to, um, and to rethink the way the, the system uh, works. So the objective of, um, of the localization agenda was to make uh, principal humanitarian action as local as possible and as international as um, necessary. And this is a sentence we've, we've heard uh, a lot, but I think it, it was quite interesting to look at in the localization agenda, one of the commitments of the Grand Bargain was around coordination. And um, the, the donors, uh, as well as humanitarian agencies, have committed to, um, to support and to complement uh, national coordination mechanisms when they existed, and also to better include local and national responders in international coordination mechanisms like the cluster system whenever it was appropriate and, and also in keeping in mind with um, the humanitarian principles. And I think this is an interesting commitment um, that was maybe a little bit overlooked um, in the work that has been done around the, the localization agenda. There's been a lot of work, a lot of thinking that has already been done on, um, on localization, but more from the perspective of how do we engage with partners for programming. Uh, what our partnership models uh, look like, or what kind of capacity needs to be strengthened. And this was a little bit um, the dominant approach, I think, of the, of the localization agenda, uh, more looking at localization from a programmatic aspect, rather than looking at localization as a, as a model to rethink a little bit the, the system as a whole. And so, um, what has been interesting in, in, the, in, what, in the GPC initiative around localization was really that uh, we, we had a strong belief that um, to make the localization agenda a reality, the coordination groups like the global clusters and the field clusters also had, um, it, it represented for, for them an opportunity to, to impulse um, a system-wide shift because of their collaboration with local actors. Um, if you look at uh, how protection coordination group uh, work, um, they work very closely with hundreds of local governments and civil society actors. So if you look at the membership of the, of the clusters in the field, you would see that uh, generally up to 75% of the um, coordination group members are local actors. And the rationale be behind um, including local actors in, in the cluster system is that they are usually the first and the last responders when an emergency hits, and um, and they bring to the table a, a wealth of information, of understanding of the context, because they have this um, this better no better knowledge of the cultural historical um, uh, context. They also have greater credibility, I think, because they have access to local networks. They have better access to affected communities, um, and so all of this can significantly contribute to the, um, to the relevance of the humanitarian response um, because of 
of this understanding of the context and because of the sensitivity um, that, uh, that they bring uh, to the discussion. So I think the coordination groups uh, really can draw on these local networks to improve um, protection analysis, to improve uh, coordination, um, to document and to disseminate uh, lessons learned, and also to encourage good practices to be, um, to be taken to scale. Um, I think we also yeah, need to acknowledge like, the, that protection coordina coordination groups are leading the development of um, humanitarian protection response at the national level with, uh, with uh, usually with uh, governments and they, um, they really can help governments, donors, pool fund managers to decide when and where to invest uh, their resources in terms of advocacy, in terms of funding, in terms of capacity strengthening. So the coordination groups have both this obligation to promote the localization agenda because there's been a global commitment on that, but it's also uh, an opportunity uh, for for them to support uh, agencies to um, uh, to advance this localization agenda, to take successful localization pilot to scale, to mobilize resources, um, and to rethink a little bit the, the structure and the way the system works. And this would ultimately be leading to strengthening the, um, the humanitarian response and the protection response in particular. Thank you for that. Um, and moving on, in 2017 and 2018, the Child Protection AOR and the IRC, IC, uh, IRC have been piloting a localization initiative on behalf of the GPC. Now, the result of that initiative was a learning paper that was published recently. Um, that learning paper contained a developed conceptual framework on what localization means. Emily, you yourself wrote, uh, co-wrote that learning paper along with the Child Protection AOR, and uh, you conducted several co um, country visits to, to produce it. Could you expand on some of the lessons learned from those missions shared um, and uh, maybe share some of the learning? Yes, sure. Um, so, uh, as you said, we've uh, we've been working closely with the Child Protection AOR, and we've done um, over the last uh, two years um, some desk reviews, uh, surveys with local partners, um, as well as country country visit and and a lot of consultation with uh, with cluster coordinators and and local partners to better understand what were the the obstacles and the challenges um, that uh, they were facing when they wanted to engage with the cluster system. And we've seen, um, honestly, some very encouraging practices that are showing that um, I think that as a, as, a, as a community, we are gradually moving towards um, this commitment on localization. Uh, but we also find some, some challenges, remaining challenges. Um, maybe one of the, um, the first lessons is around, uh, as I said, the, the membership of the protection coordination groups, which is nowadays really composed of a large number of national actors. You usually see a, a lot of government counterparts, national and local and NGOs, in uh, attending meetings, cluster meetings, and regularly participating in those meetings. Um, local actors have been uh, recognizing the, the benefits that the cluster system can bring to their organizations. So we did a survey, a scoping survey, that show that um, uh, local partners see the cluster system as being uh, a great way to be informed about uh, practices, about standards. Um, it's, um, it's a forum for them to engage um, in joint advocacy, to enhance their partnership uh, with international actors. Uh, they also see the cluster system as a great way to network and to, to just share information and good practices. Um, so the membership of the, the protection coordination groups has uh, gradually been um, more open for local, uh, local actors. And uh, local actors have also been playing an important role in conducting protection assessment, in collecting data, uh, providing information about protection needs and, and delivering uh, protection uh, programming. Um, so that was yeah one of the first, I, I would say, positive lessons learned. Uh, the second is around the governance uh, structure of the um, protection coordination group, which is more and more reflecting the presence of national actors. 
So some of them are holding a leadership position, for example, in the humanitarian country team or in strategic advisory group or as a cluster lead or co-lead. This is an emerging practice uh, that we've seen in several of the um, countries that we have visited. So for example, in Myanmar, the HCT has extended its membership to four national NGOs, uh, as well as in DRC, you have um, one seat that is assigned for a national NGO in the HCT. Um, in other countries, like in South Sudan or in DRC, local partners are present in, in the SAG of the protection cluster, and several national partners are co-leading protection cluster, GBV, and child protection subclusters at the, at the sub-national level. In terms of uh, funding, we've seen um, also that country-based pool funds um, are more and more accessible uh, for, for national NGOs. Um, so again, in Myanmar, in, in the DRC, in South Sudan, the, um, the pool fund has been um, increasing their direct funding to local NGOs. And uh, in those three countries, um, the total funding that is going directly to national NGOs is, is about between 23 and to 25%. Uh, which is a good practice for national actors to more easily access uh, direct funding. All right, thank you for that, Emily. Uh, now I'm gonna, I want to move on to the, uh, to the challenges. Uh, what are the main challenges that local partners face when engaging with the cluster system? Um, so as I said, yeah, there are, there are remaining challenges, of course, and um, in terms of if if we've seen, of course, that the membership of the protection coordination group is now composed of more and more local partners who are being part of the, of the cluster meetings and being part of the discussion, um, there is still like no presence of uh, smaller local NGOs, uh, community-based organizations, um, the diaspora, uh, or the private sector. So local actors uh, that are participating in the cluster um, it's usually only government counterpart and I would say big national NGOs. Um, and this is mainly due to the fact that the coordination groups are still mainly used for sharing information about funding and partnership opportunities. Um, so the engagement of, I think we still have uh, work to do in engaging with smaller local NGOs and community-based organizations who who seem to have uh, difficulties in, in, in joining the, the cluster system, as well as the diaspora and the private sector that we've been ignoring a little bit. And another, another challenge is we've seen that local actors have really the significant role in collecting protection data, in conducting assessment on the ground, uh, in responding to protection needs, in providing services, but despite this very active operational role, they usually are not very much engaged in decision-making processes. So they feel that they are not involved in the, in the analysis and the validation of those data, or in any of the strategic planning process, such as the HNO and the HRP, for example. In terms of governance, we, we've seen that there are some good practices, like I've mentioned before, but it, it does remain still limited. And from what we have heard with the consultation with local partners through those different uh, field missions, we understood that for, for them, the international coordination system is, is not an, an enabling environment for local partners. They mentioned some obstacles like question of language, because the majority of meetings usually take place in English or, and not in the, in the lo local language. They have also mentioned the excessive use of humanitarian jargon, acronyms, and more generally just very complex humanitarian planning processes that they, uh, they don't always uh, understand or, or grasp uh, properly. Some local partners, mainly smaller NGO, uh, NGOs or smaller organizations, face also logistic obstacles. For some of them who are not based, for example, in the capital city and cannot attend or come to the, to the capital to attend the meetings, um, and s other smaller organizations who do not have the, the resources, like the time and the staff, to, to attend a very high number of, of uh, meetings. In this scoping survey that we conducted with um, more than 100 local organizations, one of the main constraints that was raised by local actors was being unaware of the date of the cluster meeting, which in a way is a, is a little bit concerning. 
but it's also something I think we can very concretely and easily act upon. So there are some very concrete steps that we can take to foster this culture of inclusivity within the, within the cluster system. It's very concrete actions such as making sure that we translate, for example, the main documents of the cluster into local language, that we held uh, meetings in, in the local language, that we provide trainings, orientation on those complex planning processes like the HNO and the HRP. Or, for example, in South Sudan, we, the coordination team had, we saw an interesting practice where the coordination team has a dedicated person to support the engagement of, of national partners. I think one of the other challenges that, that is linked to this, um, it's really around the capacity of national NGOs to meaningfully engage with the cluster system, which seems to remain a little bit challenging because most of them don't have like unre unrestricted funding to cover their core costs. They don't have the resources, the long-term funding that participation in the humanitarian system requires. And in addition to that, they all our capacity strengthening efforts over the last few years have generally very much focused on the technical areas of protection. So we've been providing trainings on, on protection standards, on protection monitoring, on case management, on protection mainstreaming, which is of course extremely important, but the institutional capacity strengthening remains very limited. And um, if we want national partners to be meaningfully engaging with the cluster system, we also need to be supporting uh, the sustainability of, of the organization to ensure that they can effectively participate in, in those uh, coordination. Like Finally, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that there are some specific uh, challenges to localizing protection. There's really a growing recognition that local and national actors can make very significant contribution to the humanitarian response but their leadership in, protection, in the protection sector remains a little bit subject to, to caution. Uh, there's been several research studies that shows that sometimes local leadership might, in some instances, undermine protection outcomes or the quality of the protection response. Some research and study uh, show that there are sometimes some doubts about the ability of local and national actors to implement impartial and independent humanitarian response. Others have pointed out the difference of approaches to protection programming and sometimes the disconnect of understanding of what protection means for a national actor versus an international actors, actor. And I think we need to, to acknowledge all of those challenges that are very specific to, to protection. Okay, thank you so much, Emily. I, uh, I would like to ask you then now, what are some of the recommendations and what do you think the way forward is? Um, well, as just to build upon a little bit um, the challenges that I just mentioned that are also very specific to the protection uh, sector, I think this is where coordination structure are so important and particularly for us in the protection sector. The cluster in general and the cluster coordinators have have a role to play in, in assessing what is the appropriate balance of contributions between local and international actors. Uh, I think that we've been looking at the, the localization agenda and we've understood it sometimes as the obligation to go 100% local. And I think this is not, this is not a correct approach. As, as I was saying in the introduction, the objective of the localization commitment is to uh, make principal humanitarian action as local as possible and as international as necessary. And, um, and the coordination group uh, can play this role in assessing and finding this appropriate balance of or configuration of what needs to be local and what needs to be international. And this should not be like a one-time evaluation, but rather a continuous process that seeks to find this, this right balance. In the protection sector, the degree to which a response is going to be locally led and the degree to which international support is, um, is necessary will be changing depending on local conditions, local capacity, and of course on the protection context. Um, and I think coordinators are, are well placed to, to bring the sector to this consensus on, on how the humanitarian response should be best uh, configured. In, in the protection sector, finding this, uh, this right balance between local and international contribution is, as I said, is, is even more critical. 
and it should always be guided by the, the humanitarian principles, by having a rights-based approach to protection, and it should also be supported by a capacity building on, on the substance of what is humanitarian protection. So in terms of uh, recommendation and way forward, there is um, we have taken into consideration what we've learned over the last two years from local partners and from cluster coordinators. And we need to, to support and to continue training uh, local NGOs for this meaningful engagement with coordination groups whenever, whenever it is relevant and whenever it is appropriate uh, to make sure that we, we foster a better understanding of the, what are the benefits and what are the processes of coordination and that we take very practical steps to address some of the, um, the obstacles and challenges that, that I just mentioned to, to this meaningful participation uh, of local actors. Um, thank you so much, Marie. Um, so is there anything else you want to add? Uh, well, thanks, thanks really uh, a lot for, for having me. And I, I just wanted to mention that in the learning paper, there are uh, at the end of the learning paper, paper in the annexes, you will find um, some tools, specific tools, uh, that have been developed to um, to respond to some of those challenges that, that uh, we've just discussed uh, together, and and you will find training materials, self-assessment tools to um, to look at how um, how coordination groups are um, are advancing this this localization uh, agenda within uh, within the cluster system. Uh, so I would I would recommend um, if you are interested by the subject to to have a look at, at this learning paper, which has more information and then very concrete uh, tools and, and resources that you can use. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you. And now we're going to turn to the field, and we are going to hear from Muhammad Khan, who is the cluster coordinator in Iraq. Welcome to you, Muhammad. Uh, I guess from the Iraq, welcome from the Iraq operation. Uh, my name is Muhammad Khan from the uh, National Protection Cluster here. Um, we've been asked to speak uh, briefly on our experiences with localization in this context, um, drawing on the World Humanitarian Summit commitments uh, with respect to localization and how they've materialized in practice here, um, looking at uh, specifically um, you know, the main five uh, dimensions of localization and coordination, uh, governance, decision-making, participation, and influence, partnerships, funding, and then capacity strengthening. So maybe um, in the interest of time, I'll just jump directly into it since we have a, a short uh, uh, period of time allotted per presenter. So with respect to governance and decision-making in, in the Iraq context, with the protection cluster in particular, um, we have uh, made a concerted effort, particularly in 2018 onward, to invite local NGOs to participate in the uh, National Protection Cluster SAC, the Steering Advisory Group, um, and uh, you know we we held uh, you know uh, discussions with local partners to see who those who were interested because there are a few local partners that were already sort of active in the protection cluster generally, uh, so we held discussions with them to uh, tell them what you know the function of the SAG is and how they could potentially contribute um, and why you know we would uh, seek to have a uh, sort of uh, equitable representation, both by international NGOs and national NGOs, as well as uh, UN agencies, and and um, and so we were ultimately able to select uh, two NGOs, uh, looking at factors of uh, sort of overall geographic distribution across the country, um, their level of experience, uh, both with you know uh, because we have four subclusters in Iraq, so we want to have a breadth of experience. Uh, that uh, encompasses at least one or two subclusters as well as general protection activity. Um, and uh, ultimately, we ended up selecting two particular NGOs. Um, and the challenges that we had, though, uh, and, and we continue to have with their ongoing participation in the SAG, um, have been around uh, sort of capacity to contribute to the discussions because the discussions are very sort of high level. Uh, policy oriented, often very technical in nature. So we're reviewing sort of position papers or documents produced by the action cluster, or we're talking about, you know, the humanitarian program cycle, in particular the HNO and the HRP. Um, and so there, it's uh, often, um, you know, uh, when we're having discussions, there 
there hasn't been a lot of input from some of our national NGO partners in the discussions, perhaps because they uh, haven't had as much experience with some of these issues, and so it's the first time they're ha you know being exposed to these type of discussions. Uh, whereas the conversations tend to be dominated more by the large, larger international NGOs and the and the uh, UN agencies who participate, who obviously have uh, quite a lot of experience with uh, some of the issues that we discuss. Um, there, one of the NGOs simply stopped attending altogether, um, uh, and the other one uh, made a concrete effort to reach out to us to say why they were struggling with it, and and so then we. You know, try to engage with them um, and provide them with the sort of requisite support in terms of ensuring that they have all the reading materials well in advance, so they so that they can come well prepared. Um, ensuring that they have, uh, you know, an overall, you know, the IDP handbook in, in English and Arabic, so that they can uh, sort of familiarize with themselves with certain sub topics that may be coming up for discussion. Um, uh, sending out regular meeting reminders to them, and often in their case, also calling them in advance to confirm their participation. Um, so those are sort of some of the initiatives that we like to try to uh, give a little bit of extra support uh, to the national NGOs that, partic that are participating. Um, it hasn't. It still has been a bit of a struggle because you know uh, um, you know the same issues that 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 uh, the topics that are under discussion. Um, often tend to be uh, very sort of technical, um, and our and national NGOs come with very specific set of, set of uh, sort of operational expertise at the front lines, um, uh, and so there there it hasn't necessarily it hasn't been an, it, the issues that we've discussed haven't been the types of issues that that they felt that they could uh, add a valuable contribution to the session. So you know I mean we continue to struggle. With ongoing participation, but then on the other hand, there are, uh, you know, our child protection subcluster has had regular active participation of local NGOs on their SAG, um, and um, our GBV subcluster has also made an active effort uh, to engage local NGOs on their steering advisory group as well. Um, and in the absence of, like at the national protection cluster level, um, you know, the one sort of Fallback. Uh, we also have the NCCI, which is the National Coordination Committee for Iraq, which is an umbrella organization for uh, both the international and national NGOs, who sit as a regular member of the um, National Protection Cluster SAG um, and, and you know, represent the interests of both national and international NGOs. So, I mean, as a as a, given the the challenges that we're facing. Um, Often we we call upon NCCI to sort of represent the interests or canvas the interests of the NGO national NGO partners and 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 represent those in the SAG meeting. Um, in terms of governance beyond the national protection cluster SAG, there's also and the subcluster SAG there's also uh, you know the the um, HCT meetings um, and again at the HCT meetings it's. Uh, they're they're open to sort of you know the the executive leadership of all the NGO uh, community, uh, so the country directors and uh, and it's not often that you have uh, national NGOs participating, but there are um, at least one or two national NGOs that do participate on a regular basis, um, and that do are, are very vocal in representing national NGO interests. Um, uh, and in addition, as with the case of the NPC SAG. Uh, we also have uh, NCCI represented um, at the ACT level. So um, when there are sort of uh, leadership oriented uh, decisions that need to be made by the humanitarian leadership on the overall humanitarian response on engagement with government, if or on you know the overall uh, policy direction, uh, needs analysis, and, and uh, strategic direction of the uh, humanitarian response, then they do have an opportunity to participate um, at the ATT level. Um, the second sort of um, dimension is in relation to participation and influence. Um, and uh, as I was saying, there are challenges with participation. Often, uh, language is a barrier. Um, uh, and as I was mentioning, we you know share our um, you know IDP. Manual IDP guiding principles and all of these types of technical materials that are produced at the global level, with 
our NGO partners who are seeking to participate in the selection semester SAG. Nonetheless, the meetings are actually conducted in English. Um, and so there is often, you know, and the meetings obviously are on topics that are very technical in nature. So I, I'm certain that, you know, that, that our part struggle, um, the national partners often struggle with being able to participate and contribute to the meetings in a meaningful manner, given the language barrier. Um, there are uh, capacity issues as well. Um, you know, all the different NGOs with a membership uh, and UN agency membership within the protection cluster, uh, you know, there are different levels of capacity, uh, including our national NGOs. Some are seasoned uh, national NGOs who have been involved with the crisis since 2014. Others are relatively new. Others have never worked in protection before. Uh, and are seeking to pivot towards protection work. So there's a wide spectrum of experience and capacity. Um, and, and so that influences the, the types of contributions that can be made by uh, national NGOs in particular in the, in the various forums, whether that's you know, the open national protection cluster meetings that happen once a month or whether that's the SAC meeting. Um, there's also sort of concerns around uh, the provision of assistance by some national NGOs, which uh, can at times be, um, um, you know, not impartial uh, uh, and in accordance with humanitarian principles. So it would be, and those, these tend to be national NGOs that are, say, for example, the Verzani Charity Foundation, which focuses on, uh, you know, KRI, the Kurdish region, um, and and you know, has been a society group that has been working. Uh, on charitable activities uh, with Kurdish-speaking communities, and and then after the uh, start of the conflict in 2014 here in Iraq, they also started assisting IDPs as well. But there were also concerns about uh, whether assistance was being delivered in an impartial manner uh, initially, and those concerns were, you know, things that were discussed with the NGO with the, and um, you know uh, brought to their attention and. And you know they have made concerted efforts on their part to to try to ensure that there is equitable uh, and impartial assistance being provided across the board. Um, now, uh, the the protection cluster every year when we're working on um, you know the the HNO and the HRP, we hold uh, consultative workshops uh, across the country in all of the different governorates. And invite um, uh, you know NGOs to participate in those discussions where we're largely uh, taking the data from the MCNA the need, and validating the needs that are there, uh, but also having a discussion on prioritization of the response modalities. You know, what are the approaches that we want to take? What are the activities that we want to uh, undertake? Um, and, and those discussions are where uh, both national and international NGOs participate and um, you know are able to provide their their input. Um, and uh, often that means that we, you know, end up, uh, particularly in the post-conflict period, we, we have had to make a transition uh, from conflict-oriented emergency response to integrating more uh, sort of uh, recovery and resilience-oriented interventions, peaceful coexistence activities, for instance, uh, you know, supporting youth uh, through community-based uh, protection mechanisms, including peer support groups, including um, you know, working with uh, men and boys on GBV uh, uh, risk awareness and prevention mitigation measures, et cetera. Um, so there have been uh, opportunities for sort of shifting the focus of our um, interventions and our strategy and our approach in the post-conflict period that have been influenced by the experiences brought to bear in those discussions from both national and international NGOs. Um, so then I'm going to move on to the third uh, dimension, which is around partnerships. Um, so, uh, you know, with, when it comes to partnerships, there, there have been, uh, specifically, there have been uh, both challenges and, and some learning happening as a result of those challenges. Uh, different UN agencies that are part of the protection cluster, whether that's UNHCR, UNICEF, UNFPA, Habitat, um, uh, UNMAS, et cetera, have partnership agreements with local NGOs. Um, UNHCR in particular in 2019 uh, of the partnership projects in the Iraq 
cooperation, the ratio was about 12% with the government, 13% with national NGOs, and 74% or 75% with international NGOs. And when it came to protection projects specifically, it was roughly around 3% with national with uh, government officials or government authorities, uh, about 19% with national NGOs and around 78% with international NGOs. So they're, they're, they are receiving funds and they are engaging in partnerships with UN, NGC, UN agencies. They're also receiving funds and engaging in partnerships with the Iraq Humanitarian Fund, the pool fund mechanism. Um, and in particular, in the um, first allocation for 2019 uh, from, the, uh, from the pool fund, um, there was around 32 projects that were funded, including for six UN agencies, 25 INGOs, and 11 national NGOs, um, and eight government author uh, authorities, eight, eight local government authorities. Um, and often the case was that uh, um, 17, many of these projects were consortium based, uh, given that we had a, a you know allocation for roughly around 40 million dollars, and we had this was coming. The decisions were being made at the end of 2018 uh, in anticipation that there would be a funding shortfall in early 2019 before you know donors started allocating their funds, which usually happens at the end of the first quarter. Um, nonetheless, there were around 17 pro projects which were consortium based, and 11 of these involved partnerships with national NGOs. So we have made significant progress on, on um, both partnerships and funding uh, in this operation. Um, but there's uh, sort of a, a overall sort of um, uh, risk aversion on the part of both uh, uh, international NGOs when it comes to engaging in consortiums. Uh, there's a risk aversion on the part of IHF and other donors as well, given that you know there have been um, you know previous audits that have been done that have led uh, that have uh, raised some cause for concern in the way the funds were used by. Uh, um, both national and international NGOs, but particularly by national NGOs. Um, so, in terms of taking these fiduciary responsibilities into account, um, you know, there there uh, there have been concerns in the past, but there also have been efforts, concerted efforts made, uh, including by IHF and and by uh, you know the large uh, UN agencies to uh, you know put in place measures to. Uh, address the risks, uh, including capacity building, etc. Uh, um, but those perhaps need to be scaled up. Um, and so, specifically, when we're talking about capacity building, which is the last of the uh, the localization dimensions, and you know, national NGOs receive uh, equal opportunity to participate in the capacity building initiatives that are delivered through the protection cluster, whether that is you know capacity building on core protection programming. Uh, child protection, GBV, et cetera, all the different types of training that we offer. Um, what they have requested instead to uh, sort of build confidence of the donor community and the pool fund uh, is capacity building specific and mentorship specifically on uh, you know, fundraising, on grants management, et cetera. Because those are the things that will get them in the door in terms of uh, donors potentially uh, you know, funding their activities directly or uh, indirectly through a consortium approach or a twinning approach, et cetera. Um, and that's where uh, sort of the, the, what we, we as protection cluster have said, you know, that's beyond our remit and beyond our capacity to be able to, you know, uh, capacitate all of the NGO partners on, um, you know, fundraising and grants management, et cetera, uh, and, you know, application, grants application procedures. Um, but that uh, NCCI, the National Coordination Committee for Iraq, would be best placed to do so. They have they agree that that, that would be a you know a uh, a contribution that they can make or an effort that they could potentially lead. However, they don't they haven't received funding from donors specifically for this type of activity. And so um, you know that was one of the things that was flagged. So um, recently in November of 2018, we had a uh, localization. We had a, a, a mission to Iraq from the localization work stream, um, and this mission um, essentially was, you know, uh, 
uh, IFRC and the SDC, the Swiss Development Corporation, that came to Iraq, spoke to a ra wide range of partners, um, bo both uh, national NGOs, international NGOs, donors, uh, and, and UN agencies as well and came up with a, a broad uh, list of recommendations on, uh, I mean, and their overall assessment was essentially that uh, localization is progressing in Iraq, but that, it, that it's relatively uneven um, um, across different, uh, uh, you know, grand bargain and signatories, um, and, uh, and that, you know, local NGOs, um, uh, I mean that we need to recognize that local NGOs historically, in the when when the conflict first started, um, you know they were able to demonstrate a comparative advantage in terms of being present on the front line, delivering assistance in insecure areas where you know some of the international NGOs and the UN agencies uh, were unable to access those areas. But now, in in the it, as we progress along. Uh, um, and are now at the post-conflict stage of this con conflict. Uh, you know, the, there's uh, still a need to continue to engage national NGOs, particularly as we start to speak about exit strategies and about handover. Um, and that's something that we have, as protection cluster, we've started. We've done that all along in all the four or five years uh, of the conflict. Every year we've had we've articulated our in, in the HRP uh, response, precisely that we're uh, you know engaging national NGOs um, in delivering assistance to beneficiaries uh, as part of our overall exit strategy, um, and there have been you know concerted efforts by the child protection subcluster, by the GBV subcluster, to engage both local NGOs. Um, and and then this year in particular, child protection subcluster is very much focused on uh, you know ensuring that local NGOs are capacitated to handle complex child protection cases and not just sort of the routine uh, case management uh, that they that they were capacitated on earlier. Um, GBB subcluster is making a concerted effort to uh, uh, you know empower and support and and facilitate or capacity build with uh, the Directorate for Combating Violence Against Women and the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, et cetera. Um, so those efforts continue, um, uh, but there, there were, of course, you know, in the uh, report of the mission, the SDC, IFSRC mission, there were specific recommendations directed to institutional donors, directed to UN agencies, directed to national NGOs, um, on how we can do better, right? We, we, it's not that we're starting from scratch. We, there, there has been some progress made, but at the same time, there's a lot more that can be done. Um, and uh, specifically, you know, looking at um, uh, strategies for risk sharing and addressing fiduciary compliance um, um, for, for the national NGOs. That this was, you know, a, a one of the recommendations for the institutional donors um, support and also for them to support consortium projects um, and also, as I mentioned, for them to increase funding for local and national actors to effectively manage funds uh, through, their, through the pooled fund and uh, potentially to increase multi-year investments in local NGOs. Um, and, and most importantly, from the local NGO perspective, or not most importantly, but equally importantly, uh, to have a flexible, simplified, and harmonized reporting requirements when funds are allocated to NGOs, to local NGOs, given their uh, sort of capacity limitations. And, and you know, they, they don't have uh, an entire, so, uh, a dedicated reporting officer or a dedicated grant team, et cetera. So they, they, it would be, uh, it becomes sometimes too onerous to be able to report against the requirements of some donors uh, that we, even international NGOs and UN agencies struggle with, let, let alone national NGOs who don't have a reporting officer or grants manager. Uh, um, there were also recommendations for UN agencies um, uh, to, you know, to, to lobby the donor community to accept the use of local partner uh, risk assessments conducted by the UN agencies, and to create opportunities for local and national actors to demonstrate their trustworthiness, um, to have, uh, to provide support by, from UN agencies to NCCI on capacity building, as I mentioned earlier. 
um, and to re initiate regular uh, consultations with local NGOs as part of the sort of, uh, for instance, UNHCR and goes to an annual NGO consultations. Uh, but those one of the sub themes could be around uh, the grand bargain commitments and um, how how to ensure that those commitments are uh, materialized in, in at at the country level. Um, there were also, uh, and this is the interesting part of this report uh, from from my perspective, is that it, there were specific recommendations for local NGOs as well, um, which was to conduct consultations among themselves to explore the possibility of forming uh, an alliance or a coalition uh, that could guide uh, um, you know, their collective advocacy uh, and their vision in relation to localization. Um, it could also include uh, the other recommendations were around developing or strengthening uh, their organizational development strategies and prioritizing capacity building to address issues around weaknesses in governance and systems and policies. Um, and uh, also, lastly, exploring opportunities and the feasibility to undertake local fundraising initiatives, either individually as one NG local NGO or collectively as local NGOs to support their work and to support their financial sustainability over time. Um, so there was uh, you know, a really interesting set of uh, recommendations that directed to multiple uh, stakeholders, local NGOs, UN agencies, and donor community. Um, and, and you know this was then taken at the HCT for further discussion, um, and you know, now it's our role to take these conversations forward um, throughout the course of the humanitarian program cycle, um, and for donors to take it forward in in their prioritization uh, in terms of funding for 2019 and beyond. So. Um, just as a, a sort of final uh, uh, statement from our side, you know, we're, we're, we are obviously in a period of transition in Iraq. We are shifting from uh, emergency response phase to a post-conflict uh, recovery and resilience. And, and in the, as the, you know, the, at the global level, we've been provided with new templates for the HNO and the HRP going into 2020. We will obviously need to ensure that localization commitments uh, and exit strategies and, and particularly the handover to uh, recovery and development actors is well articulated and that, that you know, we ensure that uh, local partners, uh, whether that's local civil society organizations or NGOs or uh, local authorities, are, you know, are partners in, in the effort to, with respect to this transition. So that's it from our side. Thank you so much, uh, Mohammed, for uh, for your presentation. That was really interesting. I, w I would like to turn I would like to turn to Marie and see if she would like to ask uh, a question here. Uh, thanks so much, Mohammed. It was um, it's really interesting to have your perspective as a coordinator and, and from the field. And I was just wondering. Um, because you had a, you mentioned some issues related to upholding the humanitarian principles in uh, like the assistance provision and service delivery, and there's been a couple of research at the global level that underline the, um, the particular challenge that um, maybe there is in the protection sector to advance the localization agenda compared to other sectors. Um, those research were saying that in some contexts, having local leadership in coordination or in response might actually undermine protection outcomes. And I was wondering if you could give us your perspective on that and, and maybe how you see the role of a coordinator in finding um, finding this, this balance between what is a the, the appropriate contribution between international and, and national actor in a context like like Iraq, which was, um, as you said, a, a conflict, um, a, a conflict crisis and a protection crisis. Yeah. So I mean, we haven't come across this. Uh, we've come across instances, isolated incidences, uh, of specific NGOs that perhaps, you know, I mean, they the historical the historical roots are that they worked with specific communities um, and they were formed uh, at the, as ethnic or sectarian along ethnic or sectarian lines um, and so it's more been a discussion with them around 
sort of uh, opening up the the you know the the way that they uh, or the 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 uh, populations that they serve to encompass a broader spectrum of people, not just uh, specific uh, people from specific ethnic or sectarian profiles, but uh, others. And they've largely been receptive to that. I mean, we haven't had uh, sort of a, a resistance or or you know um, anything of that nature. They they've largely been receptive because they they participate in the, you know the larger discussions that happen at the protection cluster level. Um, uh, and and in the wider humanitarian community, so they're aware of humanitarian principles. Um, it's uh, it's a, an exception to the rule that we have had, you know, over the course of a five-year uh, you know crisis, a protection crisis, in particular, um, you know, certain NGOs that historically started out in a certain way uh, in terms of certain specific population groups, uh, but have then uh, been able to pivot. Or reorient their services and expand their own mission and their values to encompass uh, impartial assistance delivery over the course of time. And you know that that partly that uh, uh, could be attributed to you know their commitment to wider humanitarian principles, but it could also be attributed to the fact that that's where you know that's where the funding comes from, right? You're you're not being provided funding just to provide assistance to one specific target group. You're being Provided funding to provide assistance to uh, anyone in need um, uh, on the basis of uh, relevant targeting criteria that don't take account of ethnicity or, or, or religion or, or sex, etc. Um, so, it, you know, generally speaking, uh, the, the 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 outcome of the discussions or the engagement with the local NGOs in the Iraq context um, has resulted in a positive shift. In their overall orientation and a broader, more encompassing and inclusive shift in their uh, service delivery. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so You're much, welcome. Muhammad, for your time. I know that uh, you have a limited time today with us, so thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for answering the question, and I hope you have a nice afternoon. Thank you so much. Got to run to another meeting. I would have stayed longer to chat, but. Uh, thanks and apologies that it took so long to to organize this. Uh, no, thank you and thank you for your time again. Now we are going to turn to Pakistan and we will talk with uh, Muhammad Hamza Malik. Muhammad is the Chief Executive Officer at the Motivational Humanitarian Management in Deir Smail Khan. Hello Muhammad and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you Mulham for introducing me. Uh, Greetings from Pakistan. Hope you all are fine and doing well. It is a great pleasure to represent Pakistan in the webcast of uh, the Global Protection Cluster. Perfect. Um, I, w I would like to start with the first question. I want to ask about um, uh, specific challenges um, local partners in Pakistan encounter when engaging with the cluster system or coordination mechanism. Um, uh, it seems that the funding is an issue as it's uh, you know, usually granted to national NGOs, which are quite big. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's also rare to see initiatives that build local partners' organization, uh, organizational capacity, allowing them to compete for funding. Uh, could you expand a bit on, this, on these two issues, please? Majority of the local organizations are having limited institutional capacity and they are working at grassroots level in their respective areas. Mostly, they do not have the access or knowledge about the ongoing cluster system or coordination mechanisms at provincial level because there is a gap of information flow from national forums to provincial field forums. Eventually, their meaningful participation becomes a challenge in the cluster. While focusing on the localization agenda, major issue which a local organization faces is winning the project against call for proposal. The grant usually goes to national NGOs which are having rich profiles, expertise, and linkages to stay connected with the cluster systems and avail timely funding opportunities. This makes it difficult for the organizations working at district level to compete because they have less experience and they lack human expertise. 
And like I said, the limited organizational capacity of local partners usually prevents to apply for a grant because they lack them to take initiatives to fulfill the eligibility criteria set by the donor. And even if they complete the initial requirement, their scoring counts less during evaluation through field assessment and review of the panel. So the donor keeps working with limited active organizations in the loop who are awarded the grant and they do not get the chance to interact with other local partners who are very much interested to work and have the interest to provide humanitarian services in their relevant areas. This eventually discourages the new local partners to apply for a new grant when advertised. As you know that the sustainability and survival of local organizations in their areas is usually based on funding which keeps them active to provide services to the identified beneficiaries. Mostly their income generation is from membership fees and local donations which keep fluctuating with the passage of time and sometimes it is not sufficient to provide the services as planned. So if they don't get a funded project from any respective donor and if they rely only on set sources that is membership fees and local donations then it becomes difficult for the organization to survive against their mission statement and to achieve their set vision the basic thing we should focus on is the organizational strength where donors should prioritize building the capacities of local NGOs in the areas of grants compliance, monitoring and evaluation, proposal development, strengthening policies at the basis of need assessment, need identified. Only by doing this, we can ensure that local organizations would come at a level to develop and implement projects in a systematic way. Okay, thank you. And uh, can you think of, uh, maybe do you want to mention or do you want to talk about a specific initiative uh, that was done uh, to build the local partners capacity do you have uh, anything actually, in mind about that no there is no uh, actually global protection cluster has not yet started such initiative in pakistan to provide such capacity building programs through different projects to enhance their expertise and skills mm -hmm. but yes in the past there my, uh, there was uh, different projects over the years, like very minimum, which came to actually build the capacities of the local organizations, CSOs, to again, actually survive and compete in this environment. So by the, uh, I would suggest um, uh, Global Protection Cluster to focus on this because we have the agenda to achieve in the 2021. So it can be a very fruitful initiative in Pakistan for local organizations. Oh. Okay, and um, I also want to ask you about, uh, well, the fact that Pakistan has been transitioning from uh, protection cluster to local authorities. I, I would like to ask if you can talk about challenges or maybe lesson learned uh, about this, uh, this transitioning. As you already know, that UNHCR was leading and IRC was co-leading the protection cluster of Pakistan at provincial level in Peshawar. Protection cluster handed over to FDMA, Fatah Disaster Management Authority, through letter of understanding in 2017, and it was decided that handing over process will complete by the end of March 2018. <clears throat> So FDMA was totally leading the cluster after transition and initial meetings were good. But with the passage of time, FDA involvement got less and no such meetings were conducted in the future. One of the reasons of deactivation of protection cluster can be lacking of human capacities or roles of responsibility in the organization. FDMA situation is currently different because FATA is merged with Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province and will be considered as district and not agency. In the future, FDMA situation will be different. So there are few challenges faced uh, or lessons learned after transition of protection cluster to local authorities, which is FDMA. Starting from NOC issues increased in protection projects. There are no funding opportunities due to non-active protection clusters. Protection mainstreaming decreased due to deactivation of opportunity to build and works for new local 
partners attending the cluster meeting is stopped. Flow of updated information in terms of protection active pipes attending the cluster meetings is discontinued. Currently, there is no cluster of protection at national level, provincial level, and at district level to coordinate protection related concerns of the affected population that is IDPs and refugees. Hi, can I can I jump in? Maybe I I, I was quite interested to know Mohammed how um in the absence of, of a cluster how do local actors actually coordinate uh um with each other and whether whether you have any any lessons learned you want to share on how how local partners have been coordinating in um, in the absence of a of a formal coordination system uh, i think that would be interesting uh for us to to understand in in the transitioning process uh, if we talk about uh, starting from a district level, there used, uh, there used to be a district coordination working group where the local organizations and you and the government departments relevant were used to have a uh, meeting. We established a referral mechanism of four double metrics and uh, they used to refer the cases of uh, protection concerns like documentation issues or protection issues. And uh, with the passage of time, then after transition, uh, and as you know, in the uh, uh, past coming years, the funding decreased and the sector has been squeezed a lot. So many of the potential local organizations stopped working due to uh, non, uh, survival of non-funding. So the referral mechanism became is weak now and the effectivity of protection cluster is affected. In the past, when the cluster was activated, uh, there used to be a district coordination working group in district Darius Mel Khan, in district Banu, in district Kwa, and in district Peshawar. And these mm -hmm. uh, issues and concerns used to be highlighted and parted to the protection cluster for child protection and GBV concerns. Mm -hmm. But after the transition and after the uh, uh, decrease of fundings, many organizations uh, uh, stopped working or only few were remaining active and the mechanism became very weak and you can say that at the moment, there is no such uh, active uh, uh, referral mechanism or a group going on in the district in our country in respect of protection concerns. Okay, thank you very much. Thank uh, you so much, Muhammad, for being with us. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and giving me the opportunity to be a part of this discussion and webcast. Thank you so much, Muhammad, for your time. Thank, thank you again. And, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be on the and uh, thank you so much.